Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's very nice to be in the real world. I think even on the other side of the Danube it counts as the real world, yes. Um, so I'm going to be quite a contrast from Virginie's talk. Um, so from real biology to something quite abstract, I'm going to talk about how we understand haplotypes, haplotype structure, haplotype blocks. Um, and I should say something about the, the origin of this, um, this project. It's turned into a paper which will be on, which is on the bioarchive, I think, somewhere. Um, and we're just in stages of revision, so we hope to get it published quite soon. It started from a collaboration with Frank Chan in Tübingen, who's developed a really clever new method called haplotagging for generating linked read sequences, um, basically by um, taking a, a long DNA molecule, wrapping it around a bead, uh, chopping it up and tagging it with a particular barcode, doing Illumina sequencing, and then the barcodes allow you to stitch together effectively computationally the, the small fragments, 200 base pair fragments that come from the same long molecule. So it's a way of effectively getting long read sequencing. So I was talking to, to Frank about how one could opt optimize this method. And to do that, one has to understand the structure of haplotypes in the population to allow, you know, and maybe I shouldn't go into this because it got rather arcane and complicated. And as we were doing this, we realized we didn't actually understand what was determining the haplotype structure or what people meant when they talked about haplotype blocks and so on. So we started to draw back a bit and, um, and wrote um, th this article, which um, in the end was led by by Dasha, but Daria Schipolina, who uh, was in IST with me and has been in the last couple of years actually in Uppsala. Um, also working with Arka Paul and Sean Stankowski, who are at IST. Um, so as you'll see, actually, I'm not sure how much I contributed. The main challenge in the work was to produce clever visuals, uh, which was largely Dasha and Sean, um, to visualize the structure of ancestry. Um, so it'll be probably a slightly odd talk. Maybe I'll start getting into it. Let's first of all you know, actually look at some haplotypes. This is um, from quite an old paper actually, where uh, people in the early days of human genomics um, sequenced um, cell lines so that you could get haploid genomes without the nightmare of phasing diploid genomes. And what we have here is a long stretch, the whole of chromosome 21, I think it was, um, going vertically. And then we have, you know, the order of 15 individual haploid genomes here. So these are 15 haplotypes running vertically. If you look in detail, you see that there's structure there. It's not just random um, SNP variation with the yellow and the blue are arbitrary SNP states. But you have kind of blocks. You have a region um, here which seems to share a certain combination. So as we look, let's say, across these individuals, we get this combination repeatedly. You see that block. So you can see the sort of block-like structure in data in, in many ways. You also see it perhaps more familiarly when you do a genome scan and you, you measure something like diversity or FST, you see sudden changes in the characteristics as you move along the genome. So that's kind of qualitatively what people mean when they talk about haplotype structure. But to get the terminology straight, no, when we talk about haplotype, we simply mean a haploid genome. Um, as I sort of tried to illustrate there, you often see structure there. And in the sort of classical population genetics jargon, you'd say there's linkage disequilibrium. You say there are correlations between the state of one site and the state of another site. And this haplotype structure is, you know, an important signal of the underlying evolutionary process. And I guess that's my main uh, interest in it, but also also in practice, um, it's important for phasing. You know, if you have a diploid genome, you can't work out whether the uh, SNPs are in coupling or repulsion. Which way around are they? You want to phase it. You want to extract the pair of haplotypes from the single diplotype. And this, you know, you can do if you understand the underlying haplotype structure by a statistical process. And very closely related to that is the idea, idea of imputation. If you go back actually to this example, one of the, you know, the main motivation, in fact, for this illustration I show here is that you could um, realize that you can just 
genotype, let's say this SNP and this SNP, and infer the state of the adjacent genome. I mean, not completely reliably, but to, to a good degree, you can extract most of the information from this very large number of SNPs from of the order of 10%. So you impute the full genotype from a subset. And this you know, was and still is a really important you know, efficiency in genotyping. So there's sort of practical issues in uh, genomics, but my real interest is understanding what the structure here, pattern of linkage disequilibrium, the, the block-like structure, how does that arise? And essentially it arises through the pattern of ancestry, through this, the shared genomic material as one traces back the ancestry of a sample of genomes. And, you know, we, we all, I guess, think that we sort of understand this and it's somewhat intuitive. Um, but the more I, more often I give this talk, the more often I look through these figures, the less intuitive it seems in some ways. You will see a very rich structure with all kinds of features, which are really quite, you know, quite tricky, I think. Okay, so for the concept that actually I start from, maybe because I'm old fashioned, is the classical concept of identity by descent. And this goes back to the 1920s, really, as a way of understanding and quantifying inbreeding. And the idea is that if you look at a particular genetic locus and you look at um, you know, a sample of, of genes, then you can ask, are these genes identical by descent from a single ancestral gene? Okay. And when you define identity by descent in this way, you're defining it relative to a reference population, some founder population, which actually is very natural for many of you in this room. When you're studying the sort of evolved sequence experiments, you have a set of founders. You have a set of, you know, I don't know, 100 genomes, which are the founders of everything you see. And because you're looking at short term experiments, you know, maybe ignore mutation uh, to a first approximation and you'll, you'll be able to trace whether a chunk of genome here is identical by descent to a chunk of genome here from an ancestor in the reference population. So to, to illustrate this with a, a nice colored picture, which is just a very simple simulation, small population, you start out at t equals naught with, I think it's about yeah 50 genomes and you color the genomes in each with a different color. So you have a series of vertical, sorry, of horizontal stripes, the blue genome, the red genome, the green genome, and so on straightforward. And as you go through after about 10 generations in this small population, you'll see that any particular chunk of genome in, in this individual, this comes from the orange genome, and then this bit comes from the blue genome and so on. So you have this sort of mosaic structure. This is, you know, what inheritance really looks like. Okay. And to a large extent, of course, you know, if we knew the initial genomes, we could immediately infer these in practice, as you all know, it's not quite so straightforward. But as you go on, you lose genetic diversity and certain regions start to um, fix for a single genotype. So now this whole region in the whole population is fixed for uh, a single ancestral genome, let's say here, right? And eventually if we went on for another 100 generations, 200 generations, you get a series of vertical stripes which say that the whole population is identical by descent to one or other of these ancestral genomes. Okay. So the whole process is a conversion of diversity between genomes into, if you like, diversity between the origin of different chunks of genome. Okay. So that's the process and that's all very straightforward. If you're thinking of an experimental population where you know the founders, okay, but that's not usually the case if we're dealing with natural populations. The fundamental structure is what's called the ancestral recombination graph. And this is something that was described really very early on in um, when people started thinking about the coalescent process you know, in the 1980s um, and I think one of the nicest early descriptions is by, by Hudson around you know late 80s I think. Um, so what we have is we're all familiar with at any point in the genome you have a genealogy right and as you move along the genome the genealogy will persist until there's a recombination event, until there's a point at which one individual ancestor actually has uh, material inherited from one parent chromosome versus another parent chromosome. So this is something that happens at meiosis. If you look at a haploid gamete, that comes from a diploid cell in meiosis. And if there's a crossover, there'll be a chunk you know, to the left of the crossover point that comes from this uh, 
maternal chromosome in the diploid and another chunk that comes from the other chromosome, the homologous chromosome. So at meiosis, you have a recombination event. So these events of both coalescence where two uh, chunks of genome come from the same uh, ancestor and coalesce as you go backwards in time and the recombination events as one lineage as you trace it back comes from two different ancestral chromosomes these sort of merging and splitting produce a graph you know, a structure with with coalescence and recombination and the 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 nodes on this graph the coalescence events the recombination events are real events they're real individuals that lived sometime in the past i think it's really helpful to bear that in mind that is not a well, it is an abstract concept. We can't quite uh, directly observe that unless we have a pedigree. And so maybe Andy will give us some actual examples you know, um, in the next talk. But we, you know, we have a real st structure with real events of coalescence and recombination. We see that reflected in, uh, in the sequence data. Of course, we can't see it quite directly. What we see are sequence variants, and we can simplify it by thinking of, you know, I'll be thinking of infinite sites mutation where we have basically a low rate of mutation, but on a long genome so that we have variants that arise that are essentially unique and that mark a particular mutation event. And they decorate this ancestral recombination graph. And as we'll see, I'll go through some really sort of detailed examples that allows one to infer the underlying ancestry. In practice, of course, you need enough SNPs and what enough is, is not quite so straightforward, but you can in practice, we know with, with real populations, particularly with human data, but if you have well-phased data where you actually have a set of haploid genomes, you have enough SNP variation, you can infer the set of genealogies along the genome and thus the full ancestral recombination graph. And there's now software like Argweaver and Relate, which will do this with, with real sequence data with, with reasonable reliability. Although I think it's, it's very recent. This is only in the last you know, two, three years that this has come out. And so it's still a bit of an open question. Firstly, how accurate these inferences are, obviously it depends on how much diversity you have, but also whether, you know, as some people argue, we should actually shift from using all our kind of hokey old fashioned statistics like pi and FST and so on, and to genus D, which are very simple statistics from the early days when we were looking at single locus variation. How do we shift from that to using the full information in the whole ancestral recombination graph, which in some sense we can kind of observe, right? So I'm going to go through a couple of, well, three pictures, basically. <laughs> That's the rest of the, the talk, um, but they're quite dense pictures. And Maybe you need good eyesight to see it. I hope they're sort of reasonably visible. So this is sort of leading into the, the idea that we have, as we move along the genome here, we have genealogies at a particular point in the genome. We have this relationship between, what is it, 11, two, three, four, five, yeah, 11 um, sampled haploid genomes. And so they have to have a common ancestor. They have some sort of pattern of relationship. And what we see is, you know, a set of genomes which carry this relationship. But as we move along, at some point, there'll be a recombination event, which will cause a single change in which a lineage going back. In fact, it's, it's this lineage. Instead of going back this way here, it actually splits and goes back that way. So the colored lines are the real uh, ancestry and the gray is the ancestry on the other side of the recombination event. So there's this one change which you've sort of identified in here. And then what we see are these SNP variants which trace back to real mutations that occurred somewhere or other. So these two dark squares here are on this branch of the genealogy and therefore they are shared by these three genomes. So you can identify SNPs that show this pattern one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, as having occurred on this branch. And because the recombination event didn't affect that branch, you see them that class out here as well. But if I can get this right, yeah, um, the recombination event will change, you know, the cl class of uh, branches that exist so that here, these two mutations are shared by this one and this one, this one and this one. Um, they also actually, they, they're still shared here because these are things come down here, but um, there's going to, now I'm going to get confused at this point. I think it's, it's this, this one here, this sort of triangle is shared by this set of five, six genomes. 
That one, yeah. So that exists on this side of the recombination event, but it doesn't exist on the other side. On the other side, we, we have this triangle one, right? So which is now descending down to there. So it's all, you know, kind of a bit, a bit tricky, but in principle, you can identify sets of SNPs that are shared in a certain pattern as corresponding to mutations that occurred on a particular branch. And the branching structure changes very gradually and subtly as you move along the genome from one genealogy to another slightly different genealogy. Okay, so I've just talked about this top diagram. What are these two diagrams? Well, this is trying to illustrate the relation between um, the sort of the modern, if you like, ancestral recombination graph genealogical way of looking at it from the classical identity by descent idea. The point is that if we define a reference population as occurring at this time point, this is the reference population at TA, then that defines the identity by descent that basically all of you know these genes here are identical by descent back to there, to this individual, these red genes back to there, and these purple genes back to there. So the colors, purple, red, and orange, correspond to the definition of identity by descent back to this reference population. And similarly, there you get a slightly different pattern. But we could choose a different time point. We could choose a reference population there, say. And this gives a different coloring in. This gives a different definition of identity because now we have a more recent founder population. We have more diversity relative to that founder population. We have the orange and the green and the blue and the purple. So if one is doing a kind of a, an evolved resequence experiment, and I'll go back to this example, ah, example we had before, here, for example, you know, you have a real natural definition of your reference population. And so it's natural to define it relative to that. And, and these are the relevant haplotype blocks, you know, which you would see and use in your analysis. But you don't in general know what the reference population is. And as I've illustrated here, you'll get different colorings, different definitions, depending on where you choose that reference. So the argument that really we, we make in the paper is that definitions based on identity by descent may be appropriate occasionally, but they're in general based on an arbitrary reference population. And so instead we should define the structure of ancestry relative to the genealogies on this ancestral recombination graph. And I'll go through now illustrating this and sort of making some comments about how we can use these ideas in inference. Um, so the key point is that each branch and therefore each sort of set of SNPs associated with it is defined by a unique coalescence event, okay? By a set of lineages which trace back from your sample, from a certain set of individuals in the sample, back to a particular coalescence event that brings them together. And any SNPs immediately above that will show up as being shared in that way. So, I shall attempt to, to illustrate this here. Of course, it's a little bit difficult to see it, but uh, uh, anyway. Um, here we have the sort of the abstract pattern of ancestry described by moving along the genome, looking at all the different gene genealogies. And this is a single simulation um, of a population in which you, know, you just run it back over, I think it's, point, it's 10 centimorgans in a small population, you just run it back and, and you get these genealogies. Um, and we have, I think it's, yeah, 10 um, descendant lineages, which, you know, we sample one to 10. And you see a certain structure here, a certain structure here. And each of these genealogies is separated by a recombination event. We have a pair here, which are separated by a recombination event, but it kind of comes out and then coalesces back. And so there's no difference. That's one issue. Here you have a recombination event, which comes out hearsay and then coalesces back very quickly or it's easier to see it here if you go from here to here there could be a recombination that goes out here and then coalesces back so the topology is the same you know there's no difference in structure but the depth is different and therefore the amount of diversity you see in principle will be different so in the other cases and in, in most cases here the recombination event does change the topology right? so of course we don't see these directly what we see are SNPs along the genome. I haven't put in all the SNPs because it just gets too crowded. What I've put in are SNPs carried on a particular set of branches that I've chosen rather 
you know, arbitrarily, I think it's nine branches that were the, the most substantial ones, the ones carrying the most SNPs. So for example, if I can get this right, this light blue branch here, any mutation on that produces light blue SNPs, which are characteristic because they're shared between, what is it? Four, seven, eight, and 10. And so you can see that if you've got good eyes, four, seven, eight, and 10, all trace back to this light blue branch. So SNPs on that branch will, will show up with that pattern. So one can sort of see the structure from the pattern of SNP sharing. And so we're defining then haplotype blocks as the set of ancestral chunks of genome that descend down to that coalescence event. So anything in the ancestry which is light blue, which descends down to this particular event, we count in this block. Okay. And then you can visualize those in a, a different way. Maybe I'll just show that so we can still see all of it. And this is just showing some of these. This is the light blue block. Now we have a, a picture here, which is this is the map going from 0 to 10 centimorgans. Um, it's just showing, you know, one genome here, but actually, of course, there are 10. We did try doing three dimensional diagrams, but it's a complete nightmare. So. You know, this is the attempt at uh, visualizing it. And then as you go back in time, we're going back in time here, and the blue are all the ancestral sites which trace down to that coalescence event, which happened at a particular time, and which leads to a pattern of, sh of SNP sharing in this stretch of genome. And now we have one, two, three, whatever. I hope the same number of blue mutations. Each of these is a SNP, which shows up here. Like blue. And so you can go along. You could visualize all of them. I mean, we. I've got that. It's produced lots and lots of pictures. Um, but this is the light blue thing. And it's sort of, um, you can trace, look, you, sorry, you can trace this, this orange um, thing. The colors, I think it's going to be this one. Yes, the orange branch is ancestral to four and eight. That's these orange ones. And you see things with that pattern there in this chunk and here. And I think along there somewhere. So it actually stretches along quite a way, but the depth varies. And the reason the depth varies is that as you trace this branch back, this orange branch back, there can be a recombination event which leads to it, you know, disappearing and coalescing in there. But then there'd be another recombination. So here it's going from long and there it goes short and short. And I think it comes out long again at some point there. Yes, it sort of re-emerges. This is actually a rather tricky um issue when you try and analyze mathematically these ancestral recombination graphs that they're not quite Markovian. You can't say that the genealogy at one point depends only on the genealogy at a previous point. It's kind of a bit subtle, but it's a reasonable approximation to say that, but it's not quite true. And that's not quite, but it's somehow reflected by the fact that you can get you know, quite a lot of SNPs here, because here it happens that this branch traces back a long way. The combination here, it's rather shallow. And then you hear, here you could have had more SNPs, you expected to, but you didn't get them by chance. So, you know, I'm of course showing much more detail here than one would have in real data. The only data you have are these spots that happen to land by chance on these branches. But if the branch has a big enough area, then it will have quite a lot of SNPs and you get some reasonable idea of its structure. Okay. So that's sort of, <laughs> I could go on quite a long time and, you know, all sort of little quirks and features, and maybe just to comment on a couple of those. If you look at these branches in this, this sort of example, they're reasonably mm, sensible looking, but you can get cases where a branch actually exists here and then the, it doesn't exist here, but then it exists further along because you can get in one bit of genome in principle, a coalescence event can bring together lineages and actually the same coalescence event can occur here, but it cannot exist in the intermediate region. So of course, in practice, it's hard to tell whether you have a situation like this, where there just isn't much depth here. So you just don't get many SNPs versus uh, an, an example where you actually have disjunct blocks. So that's a sort of quirk, a uh, complexity, which which is quite interesting. I'm not sure whether it has much practical significance. Okay, so this is a, the standard sort of neutral coalescent. Let's look at a slightly more complicated example. I haven't dared do anything really complicated, but this is the sort of classic case of a hard sweep. So you have a single mutation occurs, has selective advantage of 5%. It occurs in a population of 400 haploid genomes. 
um, and we sample 20 of those genomes at the point where the mutation fixes. So I'm looking at one particular trajectory. In other words, one particular realization where the mutation occurs here, it diddles about, it gets established and increases and goes from one in 400 up to 100%, over 112 generations. And this is on a log scale. So the dotted lines are just sort of particular epochs. Here is where the allele frequency is, I think, 90%, 50%, 10%, and one copy. So in this region from, let's say, T1 through to T3, the allele is actually at less than 10% or so, 10, 20%. And here, between T3 and T4, it's sweeping to high frequency, and then at T4, it's already almost fixed. Okay. So this is the, the realization. It's this stochastic phase here where you haven't got many copies. You've got 1%, you know, those four copies of the new mutation. So coalescence is very, very likely. If the lineages are tracing back um, you know, at this selected locus, lineages tracing back from the current population at the selected locus, that's here, um, and I'm going to draw it here as the selected locus here. We magically know where it is. Um, the lineage is traced back and they all have to coalesce actually at a point, you know, somewhere very close to the, um, or a bit more recently than um, the actual origin of the mutation. But as we move out, there can be recombination events. Okay. And here you can see this. I've colored it in uh, magically by saying that any, uh, lineage which is on the uh, derived background, the fitter background with the new selected allele is red and it traces back you know, arbitrarily to, to there, to the origin of the mutation, uh, which is at 112 generations back. But here, when it goes from red to black, that means it's recombined from you know, the derived back onto the ancestral background. So these red to black escapes from the uh, the fitter background, those can only occur when the ancestral background has become common. So out here, where there's basically 100% of the fitter allele, you know, there is recombination, but it doesn't change the background. When you go back to a time when the ancestral background was quite common, then most recombination events take you onto that background. And then in principle, in a big population, the lineages can go back a long way before they coalesce. So what we're focusing on is this sort of classic sweep, which basically purges diversity, sweeps out diversity in regions sufficiently tightly linked to the, uh, to the mutation. And so you can see that basically as you move out, you get a sort of randomization of the genealogy. So that out here, it looks like the standard coalescent and it flips backwards and forwards and you know, there's essentially no effect. Here, there's still an effect. The extreme effect is where everything coalesces down to one lucky genome, which was where the fit, which was associated with the fit mutation. And here you've still got some of that, but it started to break down quite quickly. Okay. So then, you know, what's, how do we trace this in terms of SNPs? Well, I've just, you know, colored in a few of the branches um, that defined as before. And there's a particular branch, the red branch here, which is this branch ancestral to this super coalescence event, the event at which everything coalesced down um, because it was associated with a fit mutation. So this is classically what we focus on, the genealogy and the stretch of, re of genome that shares that genealogy around the, the lucky mutation. But there are other blocks which are also influenced to some degree, not much out here, but a little bit in here. And they carry different combinations of SNPs. Okay. So last diagram is just what you would see in a kind of genome scan, looking along the genome here from naught, this goes out to 20 centimorgans in fact. Um, and this is the, you know, it's an arbitrary statistic, but it's the time to the most recent common ancestor. And this chunk just around the selected mutation within about one centimorgan, that's this region really, there it coalesces down at about, I think it's actually 70 generations back due to the sweep, okay. But then you go out and there's a bit of recombination, a bit of recombination, and the diversity is restored reasonably quickly. And then you sort of diddle about and you have a sort of average tied to the most recent common ancestor. This is a fairly small simulation example. I can run much bigger examples, but of course it gets bafflingly complicated. In a bigger population, of course, this, there'd be much bigger contrast. You know, you would go back way, way back to order NE, which might be in a million generations. Okay. <clears throat> 
So, so that's what you see. And the sort of classic signal is a region of reduced diversity, reduced pi, or reduced time to the most recent common ancestor, or number of segregating haplotypes, or whatever. In gray, you probably can't quite see it. There are different realizations of the coalescent process um, conditioned on the same sweep. So you have exactly the same sweep going on, but you know, the coalescence and recombination events could have been different. And if you run four realizations, you get different patterns. And it's kind of a bit, you know, disconcerting because see, one of them has a region this big with zero diversity and then it restores. One of them has a region this big, but then it goes down, you know, you get two patterns and is it two sweeps or not? Well, probably not. So you get, it's quite sobering to see the amount of variability in patterns in these pairwise statistics or in these sort of single locker statistics really, um, due to just random realizations of the same coalescent process. Okay. So all this is just an illustration and an attempt to sort of visualize what's going on here. I just want to finish then by making some comments about how we think about sweeps. So the sort of theoretical caricature is that, well, firstly, yes, you always have in the classic case, complete coalescence just uh, near to, or actually a little bit more recently than um, the uh, the actual origin of the selected mutation. You have to have complete coalescence unless there's been recombination. So close enough, that has to happen. I actually put in square brackets here because I always get confused thinking forwards and backwards and sideways with the coalescent. So I'm saying there has to be coalescence at the selected locus just after the mutation arises, but after meaning in the direction of tracing back. So <laughs> should one say, I think, strictly speaking, one should say that the coalescence occurs more recently than the origin of the mutation. But if you think about it as you go back in time, uh, then, yeah, that's the way one usually thinks about it. I think. Anyway, what this is telling you about is that the, the mutation arises at a certain time t generations back. And actually, really, all you can estimate from these from the classic sweep is that time t. And it's an important point because people often try and estimate selection coefficients. But there's a huge variation in the time it takes to go from one copy to high frequency, this T, which is the crucial parameter. That's what determines what you can see. That varies a lot, even given a single sweep trajectory. And then there's some further variation between the trajectory you see for given selection coefficients. You know, for the same selection coefficient, it might get going fast, it might get going slowly. So a lot of variability. And the best you can do is really say, well, we're estimating the time it took to go from one copy to high frequency. That time could actually be much longer than the typical time 1 over s log 2ns or whatever the theory is for a single population. Population structure would extend t and make t much bigger than you'd expect from simple selection. That, that's one issue. Anyway, that's you know just looking at the, the selected site, complete coalescence. You move away, and in principle, lineages recombine out onto the ancestral background one at a time. And when they recombine out, if it's a big population, they go back a long way. They go back a long way. And so, you know, you, in principle, um, you would see this pattern, and this is, is the case in the limit of very strong selection, NS very large, and a very large population. You see single lineages recombining out. And so the number of, um, the size of this cluster goes from the whole population, and it loses one, one lineage goes out, two, another lineage goes out, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, you know, it's a very simple kind of theory, except you don't really see that in simulations. You know, we have a very simple prediction in this caricature, but what actually happens? Well, as I said, you know, what under this caricature, you observe reduced diversity over a map length of one over t on one side of the selected mutation, one over t on the other side. And so the fo focal genealogy is, is telling us um, something about, you know, the depth, or sorry, the time since origin of the, the sweep. But you can get more out of that. There's a neat method by Stern et al. from the Nielsen group called Clues, which actually looks at the structure of the genealogy and tries to infer the allele frequency trajectory. Because if you think about it, the rate at which lineages coalesce is one over population size. And the population size here is not the whole population size. It's the size of this um, fit background, which is going back into the single mutation. And so that allele frequency trajectory at the focal site tells you the structure of the genealogy or take it backwards you can take the structure of the genealogy and infer from it in principle the way the allele frequency trajectory is changing so that's really neat and you know we as i'm saying we we predict the numbers of haplotypes increase as we move out that's all very well but there are complications um which one sees as, as soon as one looks carefully at a, a simulation 
So one is that with a moderately large sample, and actually I can sort of show it in the example I just had, you know, actually the rate of coalescence, even in a very large population, becomes large just because there are so many pairs. So if you had a sample of um, even 10, you've got uh, 45 possible pairs. So the rate of coalescence is 45 times higher than 1 over 2 NE. If you had a sample of 20, 30, 40, you know, the rate goes up quadratically. So even with a modest sized sample, in a, a moderately large population, you actually do get coalescence before you get back to the sweep. So you don't get this simple thing of lineages, you know, only coalescing because of the sweep. That's a sort of caricature. In reality, what happens is there's clusters coalesce and then they get to the sweep and another cluster coalesces and gets to the sweep. So you've got two lineages there, three there, four there. And then it's those clusters that come together and coalesce. So that complicates, you know, the inference. Another issue is that you don't just have coalescence because of the single, you know, lucky background carrying the mutation. What can happen is that as you imagine tracing back your lineages into the sweep, right, they can coalesce when, as the ancestral background gets smaller and smaller, and they get crowded in and, and they're forced to coalesce, they can coalesce, but then the coalesced lineages can recombine out, okay? So what you'll see then is another family, another cluster. So if you think of, this is a, a view that John Gillespie sort of called a model of genetic draft. It's the idea that a selective sweep basically forces sudden coalescence. If you look at, stand back and look at it, you're seeing sudden coalescence, but it's not necessarily sudden coalescence into one family. That has to happen at the selected locus, but a little bit away, you can get two or three families. And the number of these so-called families, you know, these clusters that are, are all coalescing at the sweep, that number depends on n times s, and you can actually estimate ns from that. If ns is extremely large, you get one family. If ns is modest, you know, you get you get multiple families. So, you know, that complicates things a bit. One can work through that. But I think an even, you know, more complicated issue is that, you know, you don't just have this classic picture of a single mutation arising and sweeping through a population. You have soft sweeps, meaning you start with multiple copies that are fit, incomplete sweeps. You can have multiple sweeps occurring at different times. And just to illustrate this, this is actually partly what got me thinking about this again, is from our Snapdragon works, paper by uh, Hugo Tavares et al. in PNAS, where we were looking at just really obsessively looking at pool seek data around two linked loci, which determine flower color, rosea, and eluta. Um, and this is just, they're just 200 kb apart, more or less. And you see beautiful FST peaks there. Well, beautiful if you stand back and squint anyway, and they uh, they you know really do coincide with the causal loci. So uh, so so okay, we're happy. What you see if you actually plot not FST but pairwise diversity within either population, averaged you know the pairwise diversity within uh, the one population within the other population. These were samples taken two kilometers apart, very close to the flower color hybrid zone, and then you look at pairwise diversity between, which is higher, and in fact. On this graph, lines here reflect FST. If, if these two measures of diversity were the same, FST would be zero. So FST is 0 0.05, 0 0.1, whatever. And so what you see is this red is the 10 kb windows around this peak. The green are the 10 kb windows around this peak. And then you've got all the other ones. What's happening is that you see these peaks, not because there's increased divergence between, but because it's a little bit hard to see, but really it seems more because you've got a reduction in diversity within. And you get a reduced diversity within this population and the other population. So you think, well, it sweeps, but then you have to have a sweep inside this population and a sweep inside this population. So, you know, we, we really haven't analyzed this thoroughly. We're waiting actually for haplotype data to really get into looking at the genealogies here and so on. But, you know, what seems to be happening, and there are other examples of this, is that it's not just one sweep it's possibly a number of sweeps. It's probably many sweeps, right? And this is certainly at two linked loci, something's going on. And maybe there's this peak in the middle, something else going on. So how do you disentangle multiple overlapping events? And I think it's very dangerous to um, get carried away and to apply the sort of classic theory for hard sweeps to your data and you know estimate stuff. And you have packages which will estimate stuff for you. And they'll always give you a number. But is it the right number? Is it the right model? And so what we're really aiming to do with all of this and what I was trying to get at by showing these sort of pictures of uh, ancestry 
trying to think about how we should go about exploring the range of possibilities, the range of models that could be consistent with the data, and how best to visualize the sequence data, um, rather than just sort of putting it into a sausage machine and getting your standard Bratwurst out, which is your estimate of S or whatever. Um, you know, you identify interesting loci, but then you kind of look at them. Uh, my experience is looking at them, it's quite a headache because you have to look at it from different angles and in different ways. So I'm one of the sort of things that we have in mind is to try and develop tools for visualizing the structure of ancestry around interesting loci. So I'll stop there. It's all very preliminary. Um, and I just got a, a grant which promised to do all this and lots of other things. So if anyone clever is in the audience and they can, you know, we're looking for postdocs. Right. Okay. Thank you.